All right, welcome. As a continuation and an extension of our classroom discussion on Friday, we are going to take continue to take a closer look at Jan Goggins' piece entitled John Steinbeck's The Grapes of Wrath, her literary analysis, and we're going to be reiterating some of the things we already spoke about in class, as well as adding some new dimensions to the discussion and to the analysis. Now, we did talk in class about the perspectives, kind of the why, the approach, the viewpoint of the author. And Jan Goggins uses a number of approaches. Uh, first of all, she's very heavy on the historical approaches. She uses a lot of discussion of what occurred during history at that time, when the story was written, and how it affected the people during that time, and uh, what prompted Steinbeck to make the decisions he did and to convey the information he did in the way that he did it. All of those are from that why perspective, that lens. She also relies heavily on the biographical nature of the piece and looks at through the, the biographical lens when she talks about how John Steinbeck himself was personally affected uh, by the experiences of the Great Depression, uh, by his experiences actually visiting the camps, and certainly those had a strong impact on how and why he approached the piece in the way that he did. Lastly, and I've just added this in here, I'm not sure if we spoke too much about this in class, but she does toward the end throw in the archetypal connection to when she talks about the Garden of Eden. And indeed, John Steinbeck uh, seems to carry that theme on later in his career. He wrote a novel called The East of Eden, and East of Eden definitely carries on that um, many of the archetypal themes that we find in the Bible. Speaking of themes, um, the next thing that we want to point out is that Jan Goggins talked about theme, and any good literary analysis is going to have a great identification of theme. And so what I've done here, and we probably pulled some of these out in class as well, is I pulled out some of the key themes that either Goggins mentioned or touched on in her piece or that are evident. They are certainly not all inclusive. There are many other themes out there in this piece, um, but these are some of the big ones that we saw in Goggins' discussion. Uh, she talked a lot about how people need to believe in second chances, that there's a lot uh, riding on the fact that humanity needs hope to continue. Uh, she also talks about the fact that strength lies in numbers, that people need to have a collective sense of unity in order to continue on. In fact, she talks about community building strength in a society. Um, she also kind of flips it around and talks a little bit about the powerlessness of human beings in the face of epic environmental forces. Um, I hope at this point you're noticing that themes are universal. We're not talking specifically about the Jodes. We're not talking specifically about the Dust Bowl uh, or the Great Depression. We're talking about much more general perspectives, and that indeed is what a theme is. Here's one that's even more specific. Uh, catastrophic events can force a society to re-evaluate and restructure its sociological values. And that's definitely a much more specific theme and a much more a detailed theme than some of the other ones. Uh, humanity's only hope in the face of disaster is achieving greater unity or that sense of community. And that's certainly one of the big ideas that Goggins pulled out of the Grapes of Wrath and laid out for us in her discussion. And here's one more. Only through giving up the individual's needs can a society continue to progress. And you probably notice that many of these are related to each other, and some of them are just different ways of saying the same thing or similar ways uh, of saying the same thing. When an author discusses a theme in a literary analysis, that author then needs to support the theme. You also are going to need to support the theme. So we talk about how. How does the author communicate that message that we just talked about in the previous slide. How does the author do that? And we, in a literary analysis, look at basically the toolbox that an author has. And one of the, and there, and there are many and varied, and you've talked about them throughout the course of studying literature all through school, and we're going to specifically focus on a lot of them more this year. But uh, one of the ways that authors very simply can help to move along a theme or promote a theme is by pointing out uh, plot devices and by just basically how does the plot move along and support the theme. On page 100, and by the way, you should have your pieces out, so if you're not, if you don't, put this on pause and go get the Jan Goggins article so that you can follow along here. Um, on page 100, 
She talks about um, the plot, the situational plot here, when she states that shift in focus from the specific to the general reminds readers that the individual's tragedy is played out against a backdrop of humanity. That's found on page 100 of the article. And she's talking specifically here about those interclary chapters that Steinbeck presents to us, where he goes from the very specific experiences of the fictional Joad family to the very general experiences of the migrants overall as they're moving towards California. Now, uh, with regard to that, even more specifically, has to do with structure, and, and Steinbeck definitely has a, a unique structure to his novel because it is a combination of fiction and nonfiction. Um, and so she states here on page 100 again, Steinbeck alternates the type of chapter, so she's talking about structure here, moving from specific narrative chapters about the Joad's experience to broadly painted generalized excerpts of the American experience. Now, I want you to notice in both of these examples, she has a tie-in to a bigger idea. And your support always has to tie in to a bigger idea. This one's talking about the backdrop of the individual and against the backdrop of humanity. So we know that sense of community and individual versus society is definitely in this specific example. Over in this one, he talks about the broad, the excerpts from the American experience as if there is a collective experience. And that certainly was one of the topics that she spoke about and themes that she spoke about in her piece. And character is also a very powerful force that a an author can use both just the focus on a character motivation. Why does the character, what kind of a person is this character? What does this character, what motivates this character to do what he or she does? But also uh, having to do with the development of the character. How does the character grow and change based on, you know, any number of elements that take place in the novel? And in this specific instance, um, on page 102, she's talking about Ma when she says, with her son's decision to leave the Joad family and effectively enter the family of mankind. And she's using this to point out that Tom Joad has changed, that there has been growth and development in his character, and he's moving from this small microcosm of society, his little family, and that sort of more focus on the individual towards the family of, and she uses the uh, expression, the family of humankind. And so definitely, again, addressing that element of the sense of community in the piece and the need for that in order to progress. Another element of support uh, that we find oftentimes that authors use uh, is imagery. And we have imagery and setting both in here, and I've kind of combined these because they were a nice combination. This is a little bigger excerpt, if you notice, on page 101 of the piece when she states, and the ellipses, by the way, just indicate that I have taken out a chunk of the text for the um, case of brevity here so I don't have the whole huge quote. The opening of the novel, she states, moves the reader's eye from a panoramic view, one that emphasizes color, sound, and feel to a single focus. And that's sort of her claim. She is stating this claim uh, as a description for us as to how the author is going to be promoting his theme and moving more towards the sense of moving from the individual to the society. And she does it in a very interesting way. She does it through imagery and setting. So she says by saying, slowly the earth dries out, becoming pale pink in the red country and white in the gray country and eventually it turns to dust. From this wide view, the novel moves in the next paragraph to a single field of corn, quote, each leaf tilted downward. Thus, in the opening chapters, insistent swing from narrow to wide focus and back again, readers must see as well that the fate of the one is never isolated, that individuals collect combine and commune. And notice how she stakes her claim, she provides her evidence, and then she explains it. We're going to talk a little bit about what that means later in this movie when we talk about claim, data, and warrant. Well, there it is right there, claim, data, and warrant. Um, when an author is building a case, it's very much like a lawyer who's building a case. There is a reason why many, many lawyers today start out with an undergraduate degree in, surprise, surprise, English, often many times English literature, because there is a massive persuasive element to any kind of analysis. And definitely when we use the terms claim, data, and warrant, that sounds very legalistic, right? But really all it is is 
making sure you have a main idea, a theme, and then finding a way to present that in a logical fashion that makes sense and is evidentiary in nature. So the theme that I've chosen to focus on is humans are powerless in the face of epic environmental forces. And that was one of the themes that you saw. Now, Obviously, Goggins points out that Steinbeck takes that a step further and moves us to a solution. Basically, if we are powerless in the face of epic environmental forces, then we need to find another way to survive, and that survival leads us to that sense of unity. But we're going to just not go quite that far yet, and we're going to just look at the, this part of the theme idea and how we would claim it, how we would present our data, and how we would explain it. The claim is on page 101 when um, Goggin states, it is not simply the hostile cultural forces against which the Okies must band if they are to survive, it is also the land itself. So there's the environmental forces. So that's the claim. Now we're going to see well, how is she going to support that claim. And she supports it on page 101 again when she explains the situation uh, with Grandma and Grandpa dying. Despite their precautions, both Grandma and Grandpa die of heat-related causes, again, environmental, and Ma, afraid that the agricultural inspectors will not let them enter California with a corpse, hides it from them and the family. Thus, Grandma is buried in California with the family's last $40. So here's the information about the environmental forces and the family being sort of powerless to deal with that. And also, um, the symbol there of grandma being buried in California. That grandpa dies not in California, outside of California, kind of leaving the old back in the past, and grandma is moving the family forward even with death, so there's a sense of irony there, um, and is buried in California. And the warrant or the explanation of how all of the claim and the data support our theme idea is uh, when Goggin states their entrance into the land of their dreams is marked by loss, death, poverty, and most of all a pervasive sense of their powerlessness over the world they inhabit. And again, there is, we're building a case. Now this might be just part of the bigger theme that they're powerless, therefore they need to find another way to cope, and this is just one piece of the analytical puzzle. Now, uh, we're going to just stop for a second and look at how we can use quotes effectively. I'm just going to take a quote that came from an earlier part in um, the PowerPoint and just remind you that when you do use quotes, you need to introduce the quote in some way um, or make it work effectively with your discussion. Lead into it, introduce it, however that works, and definitely always weave the quote into your sentence in a grammatically correct way fashion. So here's an example again from an earlier portion of the PowerPoint where Goggin states, slowly the earth dries out becoming quote, and these are Steinbeck's words, pale pink in the red country and white in the gray country, end quote, and eventually it turns to dust. Now what you notice here is that Goggins doesn't use a huge chunk from Steinbeck's prose. She strategically chooses the most powerful words to get her point across. And because her point in this particular section is imagery and color imagery in specific, she uses Steinbeck's exact words because they're the best way to convey that meaning. If the author isn't using powerful, strong language, then you can paraphrase the situation. Use quotes when it's strategically appropriate and the most powerful powerful way to convey that message. Now there are pros and cons to this analysis as there are to any analysis and um, people make a living out of analyzing the analysts so definitely there are multi-layers multi here. I thought what I would do is just point out a few of the pros and a few of the cons just so that you could see that there can be strengths and weaknesses in any piece and definitely these are not all inclusive. Some of the pros that I found in this piece were that there was clear theme identification. I, I felt that she tied into the theme quite often. Um, I found enough, in my opinion, evidentiary support. She had a lot of claim data warrant there to support her cause. And then also um, the theme discussion continues throughout. Sometimes she jumps around a little bit with the theme, but she does carry on that theme of the sense of unity overall throughout um, the beginning, middle, and end of the piece. 
pretty effectively. Now, some of the cons that I found were, um, I felt for this piece, for our purposes anyway, there was a little bit too much emphasis on historical biographical lenses. And perhaps that was due in part to the intended audience. Part of that whole rhetorical approach and that argumentative approach is that you know your audience, you know your intended audience. For you in this class, your intended audience is me and your classmates. So you certainly don't need to provide nearly as much. Plus, we've sort of discredited in literary analysis these days that whole overemphasis on historical and biographical. They definitely have, are relevant, but not to the extent they don't lend themselves, I guess you could say, to a deeper analysis. So I might call it on her and say a little bit too much background information. Um, the other thing I saw too much of in this was maybe a little bit too much summary. Um, she definitely does a lot of explaining of the events in the novel that I actually already know and you know. And again, that could have something to do with her intended audience. And her intended audience might not be some her college professor or her high school English teacher. So keep that in mind. Um, another con that I pointed out was I found it interesting that she kind of has a late introduction of the biblical allusions and that archetypal reference to the Garden of Eden. Um, I feel that if, if that was going to be ultimately her intention, that sense of a perfect society and how um, Steinbeck's view of a perfect society is different uh, than the original view of a perfect society in Eden, I would love to have seen uh, perhaps a little bit more um, evidence of that or connection to that at the end. Um, now, you are going to be writing your own literary analysis, so I want you to consider a number of elements here. First of all, I need you to consider the purpose of your um, literary analysis, and that has to do a lot of times with your audience, and the prompt is going to help you with that. When you write a formal literary analysis for my class, you're always going to have um, a prompt that's going to guide you towards uh, how you're going to write your piece. So always consider your purpose, your prompt. Consider perspectives that are out there. What are some of the multiple lenses that you could use? And again, we're going to shy away from the historical biographical because they don't lend themselves to deeper analysis. And we're going to start building on some other types of lenses, such as the Marxist lens and the feminist lens, the archetypal lenses, the psychoanalytical lenses, and, and so forth. Um, you're going to definitely identify theme and follow and carry a theme and support that throughout. And you're going to support the theme with evidence from the text. And evidence from the text is going to include literary techniques, literary devices. Um, a little tip, though, don't always be so obvious. Uh, instead of saying Rose of Sharon's sim smile is a symbol and saying this is a symbol, this is a metaphor, why don't you be more subtle? and do as Goggins did and state that Rosa Sharon has, quote, a smile that does not suggest so much the man's rebirth as a larger, more profound birth of a new society that actively helps one another and upon whom each member can depend. She's pointing out symbolic representation here, and she's using the word suggest rather than symbol because suggest and represent and illustrate are all code words for symbol or metaphor, or simile. And so there's no need necessarily to always use this, the word. It's almost more of a novice kind of approach. Um, if you can, the more subtle you can be, the better with that perspective. And lastly, and most importantly, um, your reader is not going to understand anything you're saying unless it's in a clear, organized manner um, that has a logical beginning, middle, and end. So with that, good luck. Go forth and write your first formal literary analysis.